serious matters, uh, the death of David Kelly and the events of 2003. Um, as you've heard, I, I gave up a year of my um, front bench role to look at this matter. And I did so because it seems to me the events of 2003 are of critical importance to this country still in terms of how we are run, how those responsible for government behave, what the morality or otherwise of those in government is, and uh, there is unfinished business from 2003. There's unfinished business in terms of the Iraq war. There's unfinished business in terms of David Kelly's death. We have an opportunity to pursue that now because the Chilcot inquiry is now underway. That's uh, allegedly an independent inquiry to investigate the run-up to the Iraq war, the war itself, the conduct of the war, and the aftermath. Uh, I've met Sir John Chilcott and I've raised with him issues of concern to me, including uh, David Kelly's death. Uh, it's unfinished business because um, what happened in 2003 was a disgrace to this country, uh, an affront to democracy, and uh, cannot be allowed to happen again. Those responsible must be brought to book. Let me run through that in, in some uh, detail. You may recall in the run-up to the war in 2003, uh, we were told uh, in increasingly strident terms by Tony Blair and Alistair Campbell and others, um, how the threat from Saddam Hussein was increasing, uh, how it was necessary to try to head off these weapons of mass destruction which he had, um, how the UN had to be engaged in a desperate attempt to avoid war, uh, and how at the last minute it was not possible to avoid war and very reluctantly we had to go and undertake that overseas expedition. Uh, of course, the truth is entirely different to that. Tony Blair was asked on the 8th of July 2003 by the Liaison Committee, that's the Senior Committee of Committee Chairs in the House of Commons, when it was he decided to go to war. He said, I decided that we could not avoid conflict in, in the few days before the vote on 18th of March because it was then that it was obvious that we could not get a second UN resolution that delivered an ultimatum to Saddam. Up until that point, I was still working to avoid the conflict. Uh, so we're led to believe by Tony Blair that uh, he decided only three months earlier, or three months earlier in March 2003, that that was when war was inevitable. Interestingly, subsequently, uh, there emerged in the Sunday Times uh, a memo written by my crew, Matthew Rycroft, the Prime Minister's pr private secretary, taken in July 2002, um, which was headed, this record is extremely sensitive, no further copies should be made, which is doubtless how it got to the Sunday Times. Uh, and it reports on the discussions between Sir Richard Dearlove, then the head of MI6, quaintly known as C, um, and this is what he is recorded as having told Tony Blair and the cabinet, or elements of the cabinet. C reported on his recent talks in Washington. There was a perceptible shift in attitude. Military action was now seen as inevitable. Bush wanted to remove Saddam through military action, justified by the conjunction of terrorism and WMD. But the intelligence and facts were being fixed around the policy. July 2002. And what was the response of British ministers to that assessment from the head of MI6 at that point? Was it horror that the Americans were going to break international law? Was it a determination to use our so-called special relationship to rein them in? No, this is what Jack Straw's foreign secretary is recorded as saying in July 2002. It seemed clear that Bush had made up his mind to take military action even if the timing was not yet decided. But the case was thin. Saddam was not threatening his neighbors, and his WMD capability was less than that of, Li of Libya, North Korea, or Iran. We should work up a plan for an ultimatum for Saddam to allow back in the UN weapons inspectors. This would also help with a legal justification for the use of force. Um, so there's no doubt that ministers had decided in July 2002 to go to war. That's absolutely clear. It, at the very latest, they may have decided even earlier than that. And what happened after July 2002 and between then and March 2003 
was a whole series of dossiers were produced, the famous dodgy dossiers, designed to convince parliamentarians and the public at large that the threat from Saddam was increasing and the military action was to be uh, inevitable. That was a disgraceful deception um, when we were told, first of all, no war had been decided upon and there had been, and then information was manufactured to justify the case for war. Uh, Hans Blix, the UN weapons inspector, uh, subsequently said that the British government had taken the advice from the security services, the intelligence, and had changed question marks into exclamation marks. In other words, they corrupted the system for political ends. Tony Blair, that man again, said to the House of Commons, this, there was no attempt at any time by any official or minister or member of Number 10 Downing Street staff to override the intelligence judgments of the Joint Intelligence Committee. That includes the judgment about the so-called 45 minutes. We were 45 minutes from doom, as you may remember, according to the headline in some of the papers. It was a judgment made by the Joint Intelligence Committee and them alone, which is contrary to what Hans Blick subsequently said about the interference. And I'm afraid the evidence is that Hans Blick was correct because we now know from the various drafts of the dossiers released that each one became stronger than the last until the last one which was finally released was sufficiently strong to serve its political purpose. There were 16 textual alterations suggested by Alistair Campbell. This is the Prime Minister's press officer, I remind you, not an intelligence officer, no access to intelligence data. He was suggesting textual alterations. For example, uh, he suggested that instead of maybe a threat, uh, it should be is a threat, um, which strikes me as not simply presentational changes, but changes to the whole thrust of the document. When it was quite plain in the initial drafts that uh, London was not threatened directly, uh, the 45 minutes related to battlefield conditions, the uh, explanation that it related to battlefield conditions was removed, thereby allowing the Sun and the Evening Standard to run headlines 45 minutes from doom. Sir Roderick Braithwaite, you may not have heard of him. Sir Roderick Braithwaite uh, was a former chair of the Joint Intelligence Committee. And this is what he wrote in the Financial Times subsequent to the war. A spectre is stalking British television, a frayed and waxy zombie straight from Madame Tussauds. This one, unusually, seems to live and breathe Perhaps it comes from the Central Intelligence Agency's box of technical tricks programmed to spout the language of the White House in an artificial English accent. There is another possible explanation. Perhaps what we see on television is the real Tony Blair, the man who believes that he and his friend have the key to the horrifying problems of the Middle East. Mr. Blair's prime responsibility is to defend the interests of his own country. This year signally failed to do. Stiffened opinions, but often in the wrong, he has manipulated public opinion, sent our soldiers into distant lands for ill-conceived purposes, misused the intelligence agencies to serve his ends, and reduced the Foreign Office to a demoralized cipher because it keeps reminding him of inconvenient facts. He keeps the dog, but barely notices if it barks or not. He prefers to construct his foreign policy out of self-righteous sound bites and expensive foreign travel. And may I remind you, that was the former chair of the Joint Intelligence committee, uh, the senior body uh, of officials looking at intelligence for the government. Um, Tony Blair has never been held to account for that. He has, uh, in, a, in a matter beyond satire, uh, where does private eye go now, uh, been appointed, of course, as a Middle East peace envoy. So uh, we then had a Hutton inquiry. The Hutton inquiry was set up following the death of David Kelly officially to look into the circumstances surrounding the death of David Kelly, to which obviously I'll return in, in a lot of detail in a moment. But what Lord Hutton did with his inquiry was to spend the time uh, discussing whether or not the BBC uh, was at fault for the situation which has arisen, uh, including David Kelly's death, uh, or whether it was in some way the government. And surprise, surprise, Lord Hutton concluded that the BBC was guilty of everything and the government was guilty of nothing. It was the most disgraceful uh, so-called inquiry, uh, I think, in this country's history. So disgraceful was it 
that when we had the results published in January 2004, uh, it forced the resignation of Greg Dyke, the Director General of the BBC, Gavin Davis, the Chairman of the BBC, Andrew Gilligan, the reporter uh, who had been involved in the story, uh, and led to that spontaneous demonstration of BBC staff as they walked out of Television Centre and stood there defending Greg Dyke in a manner which reminded me of nothing so much as the Prague Spring of 1968 in Czechoslovakia. It was the nadir for the BBC. And then we had the vomit-inducing sight of Richard Ryder, the BBC's uh, number two to the Director General, coming out to make the most obsequious uh, apology to the government for what the BBC had allegedly done. What the BBC had done was, ch was report the facts. That's what they'd done. There was a marginal error in Andrew Gilligan's report, but essentially the report which caused so much fuss when he reported that the dossiers had been sexed up. Uh, that report was essentially correct. But all those people at the BBC resigned. Nobody from the government resigned over the Iraq war. Nobody. Not the Prime Minister, not the Foreign Secretary, not the Defence Secretary. Nobody. That's the kind of country we have to live in at the moment, and this is why this is unfinished business. We cannot ever allow again uh, a government to behave in that way and to get away with it. And the Chilcot inquiry gives an opportunity at least to bring, in political terms, that was responsible for that desperate period to book. But then when that um, report was published in January 2004, uh, and it was clearly so far wrong that it, it generated ridicule and disbelief in equal measure from the public at large, uh, I wondered if he was so wrong on the issue of the BBC versus the government, uh, whether he was actually right on David Kelly. Because David Kelly, who, whose death had prompted this whole business, uh, had rather been forgotten in the inquiry. The inquiry centred, as I say, largely on uh, the government and the BBC. And poor old Dr Kelly didn't feature very much at all. There then appeared a number of letters uh, from eminent and highly qualified medical experts uh, in The Guardian and other newspapers uh, disputing uh, the suggestion that David Kelly could have died in the way that Lord Hutton described and suggesting, in fact, it was clinically impossible for him to have done so. Uh, those letters uh, worried me, and I began to look into the matter. And the more I looked into the matter, uh, the more concerned I became. I subsequently wrote an article for the Mail on Sunday in July, I think, that year, 2004, and it generated the biggest response of everything I've ever done in politics. About a thousand people contacted me by email, letter, uh, telephone. All bar two uh, were supportive of the concern I expressed and urged me to go on with my investigations. The public clearly weren't convinced by Lord Hutton as far as David Kelly was concerned. And as you've heard, I took some time out from uh, my party's front bench when the opportunity arose to look into the matter and the result is this book, The Strange Death of David Kelly. Let me now turn to the events surrounding David Kelly directly from July 2003. David Kelly had been cleared over a long period of time by the Foreign Office, though less so by the Ministry of Defence. He, he occupied a curious position of really acting for the Foreign Office but being technically line managed by the Ministry of Defence. He'd been cleared by the Foreign Office to engage in discussions uh, with journalists uh, to give off the record briefings, and this had gone back many years. And therefore, for him to meet Andrew Gilligan, as he did at the Charing Cross Hotel, um, was not out of the ordinary. Um, and he gave him background information, uh, not for direct attribution. What changed, of course, was that the uh, allegation that the government had deliberately sexed up the dossier uh, was highly charged um, and went to the heart of the case for the Iraq war and the government's behavior. It was a charge which is essentially proven to be correct subsequently. Anyway, when that was first broadcast, uh, Alistair Campbell uh, and uh, those around him went ballistic and declared war on the BBC and sent large numbers of letters to the BBC on a kind of hourly basis demanding apologies and retractions and everything else. Uh, part of the strategy was to uh, then, I think, involve David Kelly on the government side, whether he wanted to be involved or not. He had gone to the Ministry of Defence to say, 
I think I might be responsible for this story, inadvertently or otherwise. There was then a decision taken, and uh, the, 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 the evidence for that is in the book, that there was a meeting involving Blair and Jeff Hoon, at which it was deliberately decided to leak Dr. Kelly's name or force it out in order that he could be used as a pawn in the battle between the government and the BBC. Not a very edifying way to deal with a public servant who'd done immense good for his country and for the world, but that was what was decided by those politicians. Subsequently, then, he was outed, thanks to uh, Jeff Hood and others, and that led to his appearance at the Foreign Affairs Committee on the 16th of July, 2003, uh, when he faced uh, a difficult time. He wasn't used to the public gaze in that sense, um, and he was treading a fine line between not making matters worse, I think, in terms of what he said to Andrew Gilligan, while not uh, uh, lying, obviously, to, to MPs in that, in that uh, session. Now let me give you the official version of events, as Lord Hutton will describe it. Uh, the events uh, of that particular committee meeting were harrowing for David Kelly, uh, so Lord Hutton uh, will tell us. Um, he wasn't used to that. Uh, he came away thinking his career was um, at an end. He was very depressed. He then spent a couple of days mulling over it, and on the Thursday, he left his house for the last time, um, carrying with him his boyhood knife um, and 30 coproximal tablets with the intention of slitting his wrist, taking the tablets either to aid uh, death or to deal with the pain of the wrist slitting, uh, and there he passed quietly away on Harrow Down Hill. Um, that explanation is wrong in virtually all regards. Let me deal with his mood first of all, and uh, his mood uh, is, is um, if you like, circumstantial. It's not possible to always be inside someone's mind, but insofar as we can tell what was in his mind, he was certainly not suicidal. First of all, those I've spoken to who know him very well, including uh, UN weapons inspectors, colleagues, um, close friends, those who live in his village, um, all will absolutely state that uh, he was the last person in the world to commit suicide. He had dealt with um, very harsh and difficult episodes, including um, revealing, forcing out details of an illegal bioweapons program by uh, the Soviet Union, stroke Russia. Uh, and indeed the Iraqis in the early 1990s. He was not the person to be intimidated by a bunch of MPs. Um, however, that uh, you might say that uh, we don't know whether that's really what he was like. That's not proof, and I accept that. Um, he went to the Intelligence and Security Committee the next day, on the Wednesday. This is generally not known, um, but I've got the transcript from that meeting. Um, he gave evidence there. He was in much better form, even cracking jokes. And on the Thursday, um, the last day of his life, um, he was sending emails to friends saying the worst was over, how he was looking forward to getting back to Iraq, and he actually spoke to the Ministry of Defense and booked a flight to Iraq the following Thursday. Emails were sent at 11.18, um, shortly before he left the house for the last time. In addition to that, um, his wife was uh, ill in bed that lunchtime, and his daughter was about to be married. So it had to be a particularly selfish act, I think, for him to have gone to commit suicide at that point. And all the evidence, circumstantial evidence on his mood, suggests that that was a highly unlikely action for him to have taken. However, that is uh, not definitively proven one way or the other. What is much more uh, difficult to rebut uh, is the clear evidence which can be accumulated uh, concerning the alleged method of death. The knife which he was supposed to have used, um, we never saw it, it was never produced at the Hutton Inquiry, but we're led to believe it was a knife he'd owned since boyhood. It was a sort of gardening knife with a lip on it. Um, it was also a blunt knife. It was the most curious weapon to use uh, if you were out to try and kill yourself. We're told that he cut the ulnar artery. The ulnar artery um, for those who aren't medically qualified, and I wasn't and still not, but I've learned about the ulnar artery, uh, is in your hand here. It, it is only accessed by cutting nerves and tendons. Uh, it would have been particularly painful uh, 
to have cut through nerves and tendons to get to this artery, particularly using the knife which I've just described. It's also an artery of matchstick thickness, and therefore, you might think, unlikely to cause death by loss of blood. Particularly as you use a blunt knife, uh, the wound will heal up more quickly than if you use a, an absolutely sharp knife. I asked the national statistician, Karen Dunnell, uh, how many people had died from cutting the ulnar artery in 2003 in the whole of the UK. The answer you may be surprised to know is one, presumably Dr. Kelly. Um, if you want to, um, and I'm not suggesting you do want to do this, but uh, if you were to want to cause death by loss of blood, then the suggestion is you might cut your arm uh, this way um, and put it in hot water. I'm told that's uh, the way you might achieve death. Uh, don't try this at home, as you see on Blue Peter. Um, many people will assume that what um, you should do is, in fact, to cut the radial artery across here. And that's, that's what they'll do on television programs. And, uh, you, and, and that, of course, will loss, cause the loss of blood to a far greater degree than it would cutting the ulnar artery. Interestingly, a study of U.S. prisons and attempts by U.S. prisoners to kill themselves by cutting the radial artery uh, in the 1990s showed that, if, I think, that I haven't got the figure in my head, I think of one out of 279 prisoners only was successful in killing themselves by cutting the radial artery, which would have caused a loss of a great deal more blood than cutting the ulnar artery. So even that is uncertain, at the very least, to cause death. It's also the case, if you cause a, uh, a wound uh, of any significance, uh, blood will spurt out because the heart obviously is still beating and pushing the blood round. So you might think, might you not, that in those circumstances there would be rather a lot of blood around Dr. Kelly's body if he's supposed to have bled to death. Not an unreasonable assumption. Yet when the paramedics arrived on the scene uh, in Harrodown Hill, they weren't actually clear how you were supposed to have died. Why was that? Because there was no blood. There was no blood evident. Uh, the only blood on his clothing was a small spot of blood about the size of a 50p piece on one knee, and his left arm had been, uh, was, was, uh, was blood-soaked. Uh, consistent, I might also say, with a cut after death rather than one before it. If he was going to have cut his ulnar artery with his right hand, which obviously he would have had to have done, you might have expected blood to have spurted up and to cover his right hand and his right sleeve. Not a single drop of blood, not one, was found on his right hand or his right sleeve. How can this be? Extraordinary feat from David Kelly to be able to cut in that way and leave not a single drop of blood. And there are some other curiosities as well about this, um, about this knife and the alleged method of death. I asked the uh, Thames Valley Police in a Freedom of Information request uh, subsequent to the Hutton inquiry whose fingerprints were on the knife. Do you know what they said? They said to me, I've got it in writing, there were no fingerprints recovered from the knife. Very curious for David Kelly to have been able to cut his ulnar artery without leaving fingerprints. He wasn't wearing gloves either, by the way, uh, just in case you're wondering about that. My Pedersen, who was perhaps David Kelly's closest friend, um, uh, they were Baha'i faith members together. Um, they worked together in Iraq. Um, she was, uh, is in the US Army. I've spoken to her at some length. Uh, she says that uh, David Kelly uh, had, earlier on that year, uh, injured his right elbow quite badly. And when they had a meal together in a restaurant, uh, so bad was the injury, he was unable to cut steak with his right hand. Uh, and yet here we are expected to believe that he chose his right hand to cut uh, with a knife into the ulnar artery. David Kelly knew more about the human body than most people. Uh, if he had wanted to commit suicide, he could certainly have chosen a more effective and certain way than, than a method which had killed nobody so far that year in the UK. It is inconceivable a man of his knowledge and intelligence would, op would opt for such a clumsy method to try to kill yourself. Now we're also told uh, by the Hutton Inquiry um, that 
uh, a contributory factor to his death was the ingestion of cuproximal tablets. And certainly in his um, jacket at the scene where he was found, there were three blister packs neatly put in his inside his jacket um, of 10 cuproximal tablets each, and altogether 29 tablets were missing. One tablet, for whatever reason, had been left uh, inside in situ. We are then perhaps invited to conclude that David Kelly must have swallowed 29 cuproximal tablets. And yet, and yet, the official toxicologist at the Hutton Inquiry, Alex Allen, uh, said there was less than half a tablet in his stomach when he was examined. And uh, even if you allow for the possibility that um, the tablets had metabolized into the bloodstream, uh, he concluded that uh, there was less than half the lethal dose at maximum um, available to kill him. Coproximal tablets uh, are also uh, implicated in uh, liver failure. Uh, had you taken an overdose of coproximal tablets and failed to kill yourself, you would cause yourself significant long-term liver damage. Again, I don't think it's very likely that someone like David Kelly would have taken that risk. Had he wanted to kill himself, which I don't think he did, but had he wanted to kill himself, I'm sure he wouldn't have uh, chanced long-term liver damage uh, with an uncertain means of, of suicide. There's another curiosity as well about these cuproximal tablets, or quite a few curiosities really, but one of the curiosities is that Maya Pedersen again uh, made it known uh, that David Kelly had an aversion to swallowing tablets. Um, he would avoid doing so, he would take um, liquid solutions rather than swallowing tablets. So we're invited to believe that David Kelly is uh, suicidal, he's masochistic, uh, and he's illogical. I don't think he was any of those things, as a matter of fact. Now, in order to swallow the tablets, you might think that uh, he would require a good deal of water, because if you try swallowing 29 tablets uh, of coproximal tablets with a long axis, uh, that will require a good deal of water. You might also conclude, as medical opinion suggests, that if you have lost a lot of blood, um, as we're invited to believe he has done, he's supposed to have bled to death, then the body, in those circumstances, will want to consume water as a compensation. So did he consider much, consume a lot of water? There was a water bottle there. It was rather curiously placed, 10 inches from his left shoulder, which is difficult to see how you would put it there. Uh, but the water bottle itself um, was one of those small ones you buy at railway stations for uh, about a pound. Um, it was about half full. So we're invited to believe that in order to swallow 29 tablets and compensate for the loss of blood, he actually only swallowed half a bottle of water. The bottle was smeared with blood. So I asked Thames Valley Police whose fingerprints were on the water bottle. No fingerprints were recovered from the water bottle, they told me, which makes you wonder how the blood got on there. Then there's a position of the body. Um, the volunteers who first found the body, the search volunteers, are adamant that the body was propped against a tree, upright, uh, with the legs spread out and the back against the tree, or at least the head against the tree. And indeed, I suppose we're going to uh, sit in the wood, um, and if you are going to kill yourself, then that's a logical position to be in. What then happened was that um, a police officer came along called DC Co. Uh, he was left with the body for 25 minutes. Um, and when the paramedics arrived, after DC Co had been there, the paramedics t told Lord Hutton the body was on its back, uh, a little distance from the tree. So did DC Co move the body? Well, uh, D.C. Coe was asked about this, and he said he observed the scene from seven or eight feet, but got no closer. He was there for 20 to 25 minutes. Um, now, I don't know about you, but um, even if you are a professional police officer, I think you would take some notes of what happened and what the scene was. 20 minutes is a long time to do nothing in a wood with no distractions, with a body in front of you. 
Uh, I suggest that um, you might examine the body. Even if you didn't touch and disturb the scene, you would get rather closer than seven or eight feet. It seems a rather curious proposition that DZ Co puts forward. So presumably he did monitor the scene, didn't he? Well, no, because he couldn't tell Lord Hutton if, the, uh, if David Kelly had a cap on his head or it was away from the body. He wasn't sure if he was wearing walking boots. He, he w didn't know whether the watch was on the knife or whether it wasn't. Was a water in the bottle? I wasn't sure about that either. Uh, he didn't seem to have rec recorded very much in his 20 to 25 minutes. But we do know that the scene described by the volunteers who found David Kelly is different to the scene described by the paramedics who came subsequently. Not simply the position of the body, but for example, the volunteers <coughs> had said that the right arm, David Kelly's right arm, was beside the body. Uh, the paramedics said it was uh, on top of his chest. And uh, lots of other changes like that as well. There's also the interesting issue as to what David Kelly was actually wearing. Uh, because um, acting superintendent David Purnell from Thames Valley Police told the Sunday Times on the 20th of July that David Kelly had left his house, quote, dressed in jeans and a cotton shirt despite the poor weather. Um, that's, uh, that uh, is sort of backed up by this Guardian the day before, the day after Kelly was found, Saturday's Guardian, and the Observer, and the Mail on Sunday, which had him, quote, dressed casually in an open neck shirt and jeans with no coat. Curious, then, that uh, a green barber wax type jacket was found at the scene, uh, his, wa his wax jacket, including where the uh, cool proximal tablet pack, uh, blister packs were found. Uh, some inconsistencies. You might think that Lord Hutton would want to get to the bottom of this, wouldn't you? Uh, you might think that uh, if he's having an inquiry into someone's death, you might want to try to reconcile the various different facts. That, I'm afraid, is not what Lord Hutton sought to do. Lord Hutton, in fact, took a rather interesting approach to the inquiry, uh, as subsequently appeared from a piece he wrote about it in, 19, in 2005. He wrote this in the Inner Temple Yearbook. Now, it's a racy publication. I'm sure you've come across it, but just in case you haven't, let me read to you what Lord Hutton wrote about his own inquiry two years earlier. At the outset of my inquiry, it appeared to be that a substantial number of the basic facts of the train of events that led to the tragic death of Dr. Kelly were already apparent from reports in the press and other parts of the media. Therefore, I thought that there would be little serious disputes to the background facts I thought an unnecessary time could be taken up by cross-examination on matters which are not directly relevant. That's how Lord Hutton approached his inquiry, in his own words. And therefore, when the police gave conflicting evidence, as they did, about where the body was, what he was wearing, where the water bottle was, how many police officers even were there, because they're all matters which the police themselves contradicted themselves on, what did Lord Hutton do about that? Lord Hutton concluded, he noticed the inconsistencies, and when he reported, he said that the fact that there were inconsistencies shows the police were honest in telling the truth. Because, this is the reason why, hold, stay with it, this is the reason why, because if the police had all said the same thing, he would suggest they had concocted the story. The fact that they all told different events shows that they were honest, but uh, perhaps had poor recollection. That was Lord Hutton's conclusion on that. And then there were interesting... Uh, moments when it looked like the inquiry might actually get somewhere. Nicholas Hunt, for example, uh, the pathologist, uh, when he was uh, questioned. Um, the, first, the first opening salvo to Nicholas Hunt was this, from uh, James Dingham in QC, he's a QC for the Hunt inquiry. Quote, I'm not going to trouble you with the details of the toxicology report, was the first thing he said to him. Why not? <laughs> That's what he's there for. Why not ask him about the toxicology report? He wasn't subject to any cross-examination, despite the curious access, uh, aspects of the case. He was asked, however, at the end of his evidence, which didn't last very long, um, if you could tell from the examination if there were any signs of a third-party involvement in Dr. Kelly's death. This is what he said, the pathologist. The features are quite typical, I would say, of self-inflicted injury if one ignores all the other features of the case. So what happened then? Was Dr. Hunt asked what those features were? No, 
Thank you very much. That's what happened then. He, he was asked then, was there anything further he would like to say on the circumstances leading to Dr. Kelly's death? This is what he said. Nothing I could say as a pathologist, no. It's rather a curious answer, isn't it? You think somebody might want to pursue that point, but nobody did. So how was it that we had such a ludicrous inquiry, uh, a joke of an inquiry, which failed to do what any normal process would do? Answer, it was not a proper inquiry. It was not a statutory inquiry. It was a non-statutory inquiry. Now that may sound like a, a rather technical point, but it's actually terribly important. Lord Hutton was appointed um, with, due, with all due speed. Uh, for those of us who don't believe the government sometimes acts fast enough and takes a long time to do anything, um, take heart from the speed with which Lord Hutton was appointed. According to official event, Tony Blair was in the air um, on the way from America to Japan, um, more than halfway there when he was told of uh, the Dr. Kelly's body being found. This is the official version. He then spoke to Lord Falconer, uh, the relevant minister, and to Alistair Campbell. It was decided that there ought to be an inquiry into Dr. Kelly's death. It was concluded that Lord Hutton would be the appropriate person to chair that. It was necessary to sound out the master of the roles uh, to see whether he was in agreement with that. It was then necessary for Lord Falkner to go to visit Lord Hutton to discuss the matter with him, uh, at which the terms of reference would be agreed. Lord Hutton then had to agree the terms of reference and mull over the matter. He then had to agree. Lord Falkner had to appoint him, and it had to be reported back to the master of the roles and to Tony Blair. And you know what? All this happened before Tony Blair actually landed in Japan. Astonishing speed with which the government can act when it wants to do so. But of course what that did mean was that when the stories in the papers were written that day, they were written about the establishment of an inquiry, not about the circumstances surrounding David Kelly's death. A very convenient <coughs> change of direction. Now, <coughs> in this country, if you believe in the rule of law, we have something called a coroner's inquest. And when somebody suffers an unexplained or violent death, there is an inquest. That inquest is established under proper procedures, long established proper procedures, uh, at which, for example, people give evidence under oath, they can be subpoenaed to attend, uh, and the normal safeguards of a court procedure will apply. The rules of cross-examination, for example, um, and the hurdles required to reach verdicts. For example, in a coroner's inquest, you have to be convinced beyond reasonable doubt, that's the hurdle, before you can bring in a suicide verdict. Beyond reasonable doubt. I just wind you back for the last 10 minutes and ask you whether you think this is beyond reasonable doubt in this case. But of course, we didn't have a coroner's inquest because the Oxfordshire coroner, Nicholas Gardner, began to look at the matter, as indeed he would, it was within his bailiwick, within his jurisdiction. But then what happened? Lord Faulkner, a government minister, who'd been in touch with Tony Blair, of course, about Lord Hutton's appointment, told the Oxford coroner he was being replaced in this matter by Lord Hutton. But the Oxford coroner said, well, I'd like to carry on a bit further. But then Lord Faulkner wrote to him and said, I'm effectively, I'm bundling you off the case. You must stop your work now. Um, and I've got those details. I've got those letters because Harriet Harman uh, very helpfully released them to me under the Freedom of Information Act. So we know what Lord Faulkner wrote to the Oxford coroner. It's all there in black and white. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not particularly comfortable with uh, a government minister telling a coroner to get off the case uh, when it's a, a, a significant death like this. But that's what happened on this particular occasion. And Lord Hutton was appointed. And Lord Hutton was appointed under the Coroner's Act 1988 under a provision which has been not very often used. Now, that provision was brought in by the then Conservative government for actually quite a sensible reason. Because uh, when you have a situation such as, say, a train crash, and you have multiple deaths, all of which have the same cause, then it's actually more efficient and less heart-rending for the individuals involved, the family members and so on, if the matter can be dealt with as one inquiry rather than having a series of repetitive inquests. So that provision was brought in to deal with that situation. On every occasion, there haven't been very many, it's been four or five, on every occasion since then when that provision has been used, there have been multiple deaths. 
except for David Kelly. And on every occasion when that's been used, the coroner's inquest has been replaced by another statutory process, such as the 1921 Tribunals Act, with the same legal safeguards, except in the case of David Kelly. And what we have with David Kelly was a non-statutory inquiry with as much legal formality as my talk to you here today. No more, no less than that. So Lord Hutton didn't have the ability to summon witnesses. He wasn't required to summon witnesses. There were key witnesses who didn't attend. My Pedersen, who told us about David Kelly's uh, aversion to swallowing tablets, who had information about his state of mind being his closest friend, who knew that he damaged his elbow and couldn't cut with a knife shortly before he died. Um, Thames Valley Police told Lord Hutton she had nothing of interest to tell him. So she wasn't called to give evidence. The uh, police officer in charge of the inquiry, Alan Young, wasn't asked to give evidence. He didn't appear at the Hutton inquiry. He wasn't even mentioned. I found out afterwards he was a man in charge. We didn't even know he was there. Didn't know he existed until then. And other key people weren't invited to attend either. So we had a partial inquiry in terms of those who turned up. We had an inquiry where there was no proper cross-examination, as demonstrated by some of the many loose ends which had been left hanging. And we had a so-called inquiry where people were not under oath, they could not be subpoenaed, they could, if they wished to, lie with impunity. That is not a satisfactory way to deal with perhaps the most controversial and sensational death of this century, but that is what happened. And in addition to that, as I've mentioned earlier, Lord Hutton, in fact, spent relatively little time on David Kelly and a great deal more time on the BBC. That is a, a disgrace of a process and needs to be remedied. Now, there's one more thing about the coroner, um, because the coroner was uh, effectively told that he did have one last duty, which was to issue a death certificate. So he issued a death certificate which gave the reasons for death as incision of the ulnar artery and ingestion of cool proximal tablets and potentially a, a, a complementary cause uh, related to uh, hardening the arteries or some heart condition, which, by the way, had not been picked up when David Kelly had, uh, had a medical shortly beforehand and it was unknown to his GP. That certificate was issued, I think, on the 14th of August, 2003, Lord Hutton's inquiry had been in place for less than a week and none of the evidence relating to David Kelly had been heard. So one might conclude, what was the point of Lord Hutton's inquiry if the death certificate had already established the cause of death? One might also conclude, what was the point of asking the coroner to issue the de death certificate if Lord Hutton was about to look into the matter? Either way, that cannot be squared as a process. And I would suggest to you that the conclusion that Lord Hutton reached in his ludicrous and informal inquiry is, in legal terms, unsafe and cannot be sustained. So I'm in no doubt at the end of that, uh, looking into all that, and I've only, frankly, touched the surface and, uh, with, with the matter today. There's a lot more detail in here, which is even more, I hope, compelling. Um, I concluded at the end of that that uh, there was no other conclusion that could be reached than that had been murdered. It clearly wasn't suicide for the reasons I've given. It clearly wasn't a natural cause, and it clearly wasn't an accident. So that's the only explanation which you're left with. Now that's a very uncomfortable conclusion to reach. It's also a rather dangerous conclusion to reach for someone who's a member of parliament because it's outside the normal comfort zone which we operate in. Uh, and uh, although many of my colleagues will tell me sotto voce that they agree with me, they don't want to come out and say so very much publicly. It's a dangerous place to be in terms of political credibility. But I have to go with where the facts are. You can't disavow the facts. They are as they are. I then went on to look into who might have uh, caused David Kelly a death and for what reason. And that was much more difficult, obviously. Uh, if you find somebody metaphorically with a knife on their back, it's not difficult to conclude they've been murdered. Uh, it's much more difficult to establish who's done it. Uh, and uh, my uh, investigations took me uh, into contact with members connected with the security services, uh, both in this country and America, 
with UN weapons inspectors, with people in his own um, community, in his own village, um, with others who had something to say. And my Mail on Sunday article, which I referred to, had in fact generated about 30 responses, uh, specifically providing new leads or new information about David Kelly's um, circumstances, which was useful to, to be able to take forward. Um, there isn't an obvious person or body responsible. Now I've in my book gone through and identified what I think happened. And I think the key to understanding what happened uh, is to ask why it is that uh, he was found as he was in Harrowdown Hill. If you accept, as I hope you do, that he did not inflict those wounds upon himself and that they were not the cause of death, then the key question is why those wounds were inflicted, why it was that the ulnar artery was cut, why it was that the impression was given that he had committed suicide, why was it a strange death? And the only logical answer to that is that it was an attempt to make a murder look like suicide. That's the logical explanation for that. And as someone in the KGB once said, um, any idiot can commit a murder, it takes an artist to commit a suicide. And I think there's some evidence of that there. Why would you do that? Well, th the book goes into some detail as to uh, who might have been responsible and dismisses those theories. For example, I don't think it was in the interest of uh, the government of the day to have Dr. Kelly killed. Uh, I don't really like that possibility uh, that governments do behave in that way uh, on occasions. Uh, I spoke in part of my inquiry to Wouter Basson. Wouter Basson is, uh, as you may or may not know, uh, the man who was engaged by the apartheid regime in South Africa to develop weapons, first of all, to be able to kill people without it being detected, and particularly to be able to kill black people and not kill white people. That was his task. He had a lot of money and uh, resources to enable him to do that. Um, if you want to read about it, it's all there in the Truth and Reconciliation hearing, which have been published in open session by the South Africans as a result of what um, Nelson Mandela put in place around the turn of the century. I spoke to Walter Basson. Uh, his view was that, uh, he, well, first of all, he knew David Kelly and said he wouldn't commit suicide, but he also said to me, if you think Western governments don't have the capacity to commit assassinations, uh, then you're naive. Um, so, you know, I'll leave that with you. You can make up your own mind about that. But there was no obvious political motive for Tony Blair and his colleagues, whatever else they did, to have been responsible for David Kelly's death. It caused a, a storm for them, which may have led to the downfall of the government. So it's difficult to see what motive they would have had in that matter. Others may have had other motives. And I go through that in the book and I explain to you in there why I've reached a conclusion which I have. I'm conscious of the time and also that I want to bring some people in for questions. So let me stop there. But let me just say what I want out of this process and why I'm doing it. I want three things. First of all, I want a coroner's inquest. Um, I've indicated in my book what I think happened. I've indicated why the conclusions Lord Hutton has reached are wrong, but I don't pretend that I'm a replacement for a proper legal process. I'm not. But I think there should be a proper legal process. I think if we don't stick to that basis in law, then it's a very dangerous road we go down. So there should be a proper coroner's inquest. Secondly, we need a proper and full inquiry into the Iraq war. I hope that John Chilcott will provide that. And I'm certainly more hopeful, having spoken to him, that he might be get somewhere nearer it, nearer it than uh, Lord Hutton did. But we need to bring to book those who lied to us, including our Prime Minister, he can sue me if he wants, who lied to us in 2003 uh, about what was the position regarding Iraq. Those people need to be brought to book. And thirdly, I think given what David Kelly did uh, to make the world a safer place, and the service he gave to this country and to the world, it would not be inappropriate if there was some posthumous recognition of his work on this planet. It is perhaps ironic that um, when he was found, which by the way I forgot to mention was just after Parliament had gone to recess for a number of months so we couldn't ask any questions about it, when he was found dead in the woods in a rather sad way, Tony Blair was receiving 17 standing ovations uh, from the US Congress for giving some sort of moral justification to George Bush's illegal war in Iraq. Uh, one can't help thinking 
that uh, there's something rather unjust about that comparison. Uh, I would like to see David Kelly recognised for the work he did, uh, because while Blair and Bush were causing wars, David Kelly had actually done quite a lot to avoid them. He was the one who had taken away the weapons of mass destruction, not Blair and Bush, and I think that should be recognised. Well, the Hutton Inquiry has always sounded to me like the best written comedy um, since the Keystone Cops. I always find it, you know, just... But I'm curious as to what happened to his poor wife and daughter. I know for, as a widow myself that it's awfully difficult to get past that. Um, how, 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 I mean, the poor lady, I mean, they, how can they possibly move on after such a horrendous experience? Uh, well, first of all, I would say the Hutton Inquiry is probably, in my view, a tragedy rather than a comedy, uh, although I do understand the point you're making about it. It was certainly farcical in terms of how it was constructed. Um, I'm going to answer almost every question uh, very honestly and openly, but I'm not going to answer that question very honestly and openly because uh, I don't think it's appropriate uh, in a public session to talk particularly about his wife and his daughter except to make the observation, as anyone would, that that was a horrendous experience for them. Um, not just to lose um, their a husband and a, and a father, but also to do so in circumstances which were in the centre of the media firestorm, and to have to deal with that and to give evidence at the Hutton Inquiry and so on. So I think we, we all should feel deeply and desperately sorry for the family there. Um, I do refer to Mrs Kelly and her evidence to the Hutton Inquiry in my book, and um, let me just leave it like this. I would invite you to read that and draw your own conclusions. Uh, Tony Blair uh, and others completely uh, wound, palmed round his little finger. How do you propose to avoid any further inquiries to be simply dismissed? And how do we bring Tony Blair and others to justice, including MI6 and MI5, who are party to this? Um, I don't know whether MI6 and MI5 are party to it. In fact, the evidence is that they were very unhappy with the way that the government was misusing the intelligence and Richard Dealoff and others were, were going around Fleet Street um, effectively making clear that they were distancing themselves from the government before the events. So uh, it doesn't rule out potentially rogue elements in the security services, but I think the security services by and large behaved quite properly, I have to say, during this episode. Um, look, we've always had a position whereby governments of the day try to manipulate things in their favour. If you go back and watch Yes Minister, which, as I say, um, I say to people, uh, over time, for me, becomes less comedy and more documentary uh, <laughs> in, terms of, well, in terms of what it says. Uh, you'll see that there are discussions there about fixing inquiries in one of the episodes there. And they say in one, in one of those episodes, um, the key is, you know, Hacker says, the minister, um, can, we, can we fix the judge? And uh, Humphrey says that the key is not to fix the judge, it's to choose a judge who doesn't need to be fixed. Uh, and I think there's some element of truth in this particular case. Don't lean on someone, just get someone who's going to reach the right result for whatever reason it may be. Um, now, the difference with Campbell and Blair, I think, is that they pulled every lever they could much further than people had pulled it before. They, did, they exercised no self-restraint in that. And they did what they could to get away with things when others might have stopped at some point through, through self, some self-control. How do we deal with it? Well, I hope the Chilcot inquiry will, will deal with it. Blair will be required to give evidence. I hope Campbell will as well. And I hope Chilcot will be uh, robust in that. Certainly, um, there's an appetite for him to be robust. Uh, it's easier for him to be robust. There's some, some distance from events now. Six years have gone by. Uh, the people who are responsible are no longer in government. Uh, Jeff Hoon, Alistair Campbell, Blair, they've all now gone. Jack Straw's still there, but the rest of them have all gone. Uh, and therefore it's easier in a way for Chilcot to, to rock the boat uh, than it would have been in the immediate aftermath. And, I, and uh, I think we should all try to, all of us in politics, we try to make sure the Chilcot inquiry is robust and ensures that um, the right questions are asked. And I know that a number of politicians have had meetings with John Chilcot to make that very point. As to how we stop it happening in the future, I think that's about the relationship between uh, Parliament and the Executive, partly. Uh, in, in our country, we have far too much power for the government of the day and not enough for the Parliament. We need to try and change that balance by making sure we control, for example, select committee chairs and, and matters like that. 
It's also about the Freedom of Information Act. And um, that is absolutely key to a civilized and working democracy. You have to be able to find out what people in power don't want you to find out. You have to be able to do that. Ignorance is impotence. Information is power, I think, as George Orwell said. We have to have Freedom of Information work uh, Act working better than it is working now. To be fair to the government, they brought in the Act, and it has been successful in some regards. The one occasion when the Information Commissioner has been vetoed, because the government reserves the power to do so, the only one occasion s since then has been, guess what, over releasing the minutes of the Iraq, the Cabinet minutes on the Iraq War. That's the only occasion so far. I don't know how much more corrupt our state can get. We're reaching, we, w I hope we're at the nadir. But I would like your comments about the police part in this. You know that uh, I wrote about Kelly yeah. in December 2003, The Morning Star, and I spent thousands of hours with my colleagues on this. Um, but you see, you say, you got this from the Freedom of Information Act, that the, you asked Thames Valley Police about the knife. And they said there was no fingerprint on it. Now, the police decided they chose not to bring the knife to Hutton Inquiry. They knew there was an inquiry about his death, although it was uh, peripheral, the way, it was, the way he was, the brief he was given, the circumstances surrounding the brief. But there was another piece of police evidence which was withheld as well, as you know, mm. uh, which you haven't mentioned. I there's too much, too much detail in one hour. But that was that the search helicopter uh, picked up no infrared image at 2.30 on the morning on which he was found. Mm. Now, those are two absolutely key pieces of evidence. Yeah. Now, in a letter that I wrote with um, Stephen Frost, my co doctor colleague, and Chris Burns-Cox, I stated this was a, a conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. I think Stephen uh, uh, tempered it slightly with could be considered as. But I should like your opinion about whether it was a conspiracy to put the course of justice, which I think it is, and what you think should be done about it, because we shouldn't let the arm of our state which investigates criminal acts off at all. Thank you. Uh, David, thank you for that. And uh, as you may have gathered, David was one of the uh, medical experts who has been robust in challenging uh, the official conclusions, and I'm very grateful to him and his colleagues for doing so over a long period of time. It's been very important to have that uh, expert knowledge to, to back up um, my concerns and those of others. Um, there are a lot of issues about Thames Valley Police, to be perfectly frank, in terms of how they looked into this matter. The helicopter you refer to, um, you might also um, be aware, uh, I'm sure you are, David, and others may not be aware, that the official version given to the Hutton Inquiry as to where the helicopter came from and what time it was out was contradicted subsequently when I asked parliamentary questions to the Ministry of Defence in Parliament, which gave entirely different information. And then, as you say, we now know it, it had heat-seeking equipment on board and went over the spot David Kelly was supposed to have been found uh, without detecting him. We also know that the helicopter gave up just as it became light, rather than perhaps being more logical to carry on when it became light. Other elements of the police behaviour, um, when they came to Mrs. Kelly's house at about midnight, uh, having been summoned, the first thing they did was search the house, not unreasonable perhaps in case it's a reasonably big house, I suppose. He might have been there somewhere. Um, what was less reasonable, however, was that they seemed seemingly failed to pull together any sort of uh, sensible search and rescue attempt. Uh, there's an army base nearby. Could it have been invoked? Uh, given David Kelly's profile, one might have thought that would have been appropriate. None of that was attempted. But the police did come back, of course, to um, Mrs. Kelly's house in the middle of the night, uh, ask her to leave her house and stand in the garden while they searched the house again um, in the middle of the night. Um, why would he do that? We put a dog through the house. Why would he do that? It can't have been to find Dr. Kelly. So one has to conclude the police were looking for something else. There are a whole, re there are a whole range of problems with the police uh, and the way it turns out the police approached this matter, including the inconsistencies and in evidence I've referred to. Um, I think the way into this, though, is the coroner's inquest. Because I think if the coroner's inquest is held, it cannot possibly reach a conclusion that this was suicide. It cannot reach that conclusion. It can either reach a conclusion uh, that there was murder, or it can reach a conclusion that it's an open verdict at the very least. And if it reaches the conclusion of an open verdict, then that invites 
the reinvestigation of the matter, and that puts pressure on Thames Valley Police. So I think that's the way we go. The files are all still there. I gather they haven't been destroyed, so it's possible to reopen this matter. I, I've tried to persuade Thames Valley Police to look at it again. They won't, of course, do so. Uh, I've spoken to friends of mine in the police, I, I, one or two chief constables I know, who are frankly horrified by what they know of the case. But the issue is with Thames Valley Police is in their jurisdiction and therefore the only pressure can come from outside and I think that has to come from a coroner's inquest. My name's Alan Elkin. Um, I read your book last year, uh, which I found uh, absolutely thorough. Um, I also was very... Uh, I mean, one of the reasons why I was attracted to the book was that David and I were schoolboy friends and then we reacquainted ourselves between the Gulf War and the Iraq War <coughs> and he was going to... we were going to meet and sort of chew the fat over a meal after many, many years. Um, so I found David's circumstances very sort of poignant and odd and emotional. However, putting that apart, um, one of the other, apart from your book, I was ever so pleased to read recently that 13 doctors had supported uh, the case that David had not committed suicide. Now, of course, there is the overriding matter that David was, uh, I think, without hesitation, without exception, accepted as the world's foremost expert on uh, chemical warfare, etc., etc., and was held in high esteem by anybody and everybody in the scientific world. And I do remember reading, uh, I think it was editorial in The New Scientist at the time of his death, saying, or oh, might even before, saying how bad, how appalled the you know, the magazine was on behalf of scientists around the world uh, and the way he was treated. That he was treated as just a, a, minor, a minor minion as opposed to the top dog. Now, I've not read of any mass outcry, official outcry by the scientific world as to the way David's death has been treated and the way his reputation has been sullied. Have you um, heard of any such reaction? Because I think it's, it's almost as if this government is also you know, not, no, not only sort of perverting police procedures, coronary procedures, um, etc. Are they damping down the scientific world and the BBC and saying, shut up, we're in control, leave us alone? I think there is an element to which um, governments don't like independent scientific advice. They say they do, but they don't actually, don't actually like it. And certainly, if you're, a, if you're a climatologist in the US in recent years under Bush, uh, your life was made very difficult indeed when you said there was such a thing as climate change. Um, you might ask whether Professor Nutt was uh, giving independent scientific advice on, on drugs. Whether you agree with him or not, it doesn't particularly matter. He's entitled, in my view, to give independent scientific advice. Um, David Kelly was extremely high up the tree. There's no doubt about that. And, uh, and to suggest he was uh, a Walter Mitty figure, which is how number 10 briefed against him afterwards, yeah. but they did, yeah. uh, was a disgrace and inaccurate. I've got in front of me, it's in the book here, re reproduced, his Minister of Defence vetting clearance. Um, regular and consistent, constant access to top secret information of UK origin. Any access to top secret information of US origin. Any access to top secret international defense organization information. Uh, this man uh, had access to material which virtually nobody else did in this country. He was respected across the world and trusted across the world for what he had done. The, your question was, was there a mass outcry from scientists? No, there wasn't. But there was a great deal of mum muttering and mumbling and odd letters here and there. It wasn't coordinated, but I have no doubt that the scientific community was unhappy with the way his name was besmirched. Thank you.